Hi guys, this is Channel Psalm 86, and I am doing a very, very brief expose, if you will, on Jonathan Kahn. Um, and I say brief because this is not this is not an exhaustive expose on this man. There's so much that can be exposed on him. I have not read his books to do a thorough expose on him. That's not to say that I won't in the future. But I have known for quite a while, putting the pieces together, researching Kabbalah, that this man is a closet Kabbalist. And not to mention it's so obvious of him aligning himself with, I mean, this is just one false teacher he's aligned himself. Kenneth Copeland, um, he's been on the Sid Roth show. He's um, been on the same platform as Rick Joyner and a lot of the NAR people. I know he's even gone to the White House, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, the man is a false teacher, but most importantly, he is a closet Kabbalist. One of the things that I had noticed early on <clears throat> by doing some of my Kabbalah research is he, specifically with Shemitah, is he takes these Hebrew slash Kabbalistic words and he twists the meaning and he tweaks the spelling Sh Shemitah being being one of them again I've not read the Harbinger so I'm not sure and I haven't even read Shemitah but I have seen enough of his videos talking about his his definition of Shemitah and he does throw in some of the truths of the meaning of it but he doesn't talk about the Kabbalistic stuff of it just like here momentarily where, where I will show his video on the Zohar and the Golgotha. But I wanted to, I found this excerpt right here and I wanted to read it to you verbatim. It's from Gershom Sholem, The Origins of Kabbalah. And I actually have this PDF book and I was so lucky enough to find just so I could show you guys on the screen. Kabbalah Mystical Judaism. Uh, where does it start? According to Kabbalah or Garona and the Sefer Ha Tamuna, the following cyclical view is presented the first three sephiroth remained concealed and do not activate worlds outside themselves from the sephiroth bina also called the mother of the worlds the seven apprehendable and outgoing sephiroth are emanated each one of these sephiroth has a special role in one creation cycle each just each such cosmic cycle bound to one of the Sephiroth is called Shemitah or sabbatical year, a term taken from Deuteron Deuteronomy 15 and has an active lifespan of 6,000 years. In the seventh millennium, which is the Shemitah period, the Sabbath day of the cycle, the Sephiroth forces cease to function and the world returns to chaos. Subsequently, the world is renewed through the power of the following Sephiroth and is active for a new cycle. At the end of all the Shemitah, there is a great jubilee when not only one of the lower worlds, but the seven supporting Sephiroth themselves are reabsorbed into Bina. The basic unit of world history is therefore the 50,000th 50, 50, year jubilee. A 13th century Jewish writer proposed the world process lasts for no less than 18,000 jubilees. This time span is not calculatable by present standards though, because with each seventh millennium measurements of this time change being affected by a gradual slowing of universal bodies. Through some, though some assert that at the conclusion of each great jubilee, God begins a new creation out of nothing, no Kabbalist writings imply an infinite stream of jubilees yet to unfold. There are diverse opinions concerning which Shemitah in the Jubilee period we are participating in presently. The generally accepted view is that we are in the Shemitah of Din, judgment, ruled by the Sephiroth Genura and the principle of strict justice. The previous era was the Shemitah of Hesed, loving kindness, an eon of grace entirely bathed in light in which there exists no evil inclination and no tempting serpent. This age of judgment and justice began with the giving of the Torah. Other projections include the posture that we are in the last Shemitah of the presented Jubilee period. The world will ultimately at the coming of the Messiah return to the bosom of its infinite source. Then hell will disappear and endless bliss will begin. 
End of quote. There goes there. There you go with the tikkum ulam. Tikkum ulam is the repairing of the world. That's the ultimate goal in in Kabbalah. Is like they say it, the bliss, or I call it the kumbaya. Everybody, you know, everything goes back to paradise, and you know. Let me read an excerpt from a book that I have on Kabbalah. Like Shabbat, Shemitah is a means for connecting everything back to its source. As we grow farther in time from the point of creation, we need Shemitah to bring us home. Just when creation seems an un- a faded memory and we feel that mankind runs the world and that our brilliance has brought us whatever bounty humankind has achieved, Shemitah brings a Shabbat to the land that changes everything. According to Jewish law, fruits that grow during the special year in the land of Israel are public domain and anyone rich or poor can eat them. We are reminded that any personal property we have is nothing more than a divine loan. Classic laws of property that gave us comfort and dilute us into thinking we run the world are suspended as debts are forgiven and on the Yovel following the culmination of seven Shemitah cycles. Shemitah gives us the opportunity to melt away the distance between ourselves and creation and give the land back to God, therefore returning to its source. On a deeper level, Shemitah is a time for us to return to ourselves. On one hand, it reminds us that our inherent smallness and amplitude challenging our sense of ownership of the world. On the other hand, it underscores our greatness by providing a bridge that we that when we contemplate the inner meaning of the year connects us back to the awesomeness moments of creation and provides us with an opportunity for intimacy with our creator. Um, to my knowledge, I know that the stuff that I've heard on Khan, he talks about the land and all of that stuff, but you know, I have, I'm highly doubt and I make, I'm, I'm being, I'm going to make a huge assumption only because he's slick. I, I'm willing to bet that he doesn't say anything about coming back into, uh, this universal bliss. I could be wrong. If he says it outright in his book, then he has exposed himself already. But I think the man is sort of slick, but yet not really, because anybody who really studies Kabbalah can see through, through him. You know, it's obvious. However, there's a lot of people that that don't study Kabbalah, um, that don't know a lot of Christians. So they hear this man and they, you know, he he's tweaking the spelling of these these uh, Kabbalistic words and tweaking the meaning of what they mean. So it makes he's making it sound biblical to to a degree. One of the things I wanted to um, to show was I'm going to show the clip momentarily, but I've been looking for this teaching and I can't find the teaching. Um, it's uh, the Zohar speaks and he talks about the Golgotha. All I found was a three minute and eight second video on YouTube and I downloaded it. Um, and I, in the description, it gives, you know, what the name of the teaching is can't find it anywhere online but what's funny is when i put it in the search engine it came up here i mean all this stuff the zohar you know if anybody i don't know if i said this at the beginning or not but if anybody does any research on kabbalah the zohar is the main text in kabbalah there's no doubt about it it's like the kabbalah bible the zohar i mean you can't separate kabbalah from zohar there's just no way possible and this whole page is all Kabbalah, all Zohar, all Kabbalah. And it's just so obvious. Seeing jo- um, Con- jo- um, Jonathan Khan right here, Zohar, Golgotha. And this teaching of what you're going to see. And the video that I'm going to show, I'm showing two videos. The first video I'm showing is Jonathan Khan. Again, it's a three minute video and he talks about Golgotha and he talks about the Zohar. And then he tries to throw Jesus in the mix at the end that like all false teachers do, like their, their form of Jesus. The video I'm going to show right after that, and I implore you guys, please listen to it because he gives a lot of, again, when I say goods, I mean that facetiously. I don't mean that it's good. I'm just, I'm being sarcastic. He gives a lot of the teachings of Kabbalah. I mean, this man really gives it all out without having even to go read a lot of books. Honestly, if you want to know a little bit about Kabbalah, I would just listen to Billy Phillips. I mean, he gives it out. And it's, the thing is, though, I will, I caution you guys, it's hard to listen to because it's so heretical. 
Um, it's a 23 minute video about halfway in he starts talking about Golgotha and then towards the end he starts talking about Jesus and the cross and that Christianity came from Kabbalah. I mean it's, it's hard to listen to because again it's so heretical it's just like ugh. but yet if you're a researcher at heart he gives a lot of very important information if you're wanting to kind of put all these pieces together but um again I stand with what I say in almost almost all my videos I'm convinced without a shadow of a doubt a lot of this heresy the new age a lot of this stuff it's so Kabbalah laced it's not even funny it's all it's it's all it's all connected all of it it's all connected and I hope and pray that some of you guys will start to put the pieces together and not and and not dismiss as oh this is just a conspiracy theory only only the conspiracy theories pinpoint the cabal no not everybody's like a Tex Mars I don't support Tex Mars I think he's very anti-Semitic he's very, he's very anti-Jew I don't support him but I will say that the one thing that he does have right is a lot of this is cabalistic there's no doubt about it no one can deny it you just do your own research and you will come to the same conclusions. Hopefully I can do some more research or expose some more stuff on con, but it's going to take some time. This has taken me a long time to even put together, put this together. But um, God bless you guys, and you guys take care. The Zohar speaks, the rabbis are writing, of the redemption of the world with Messiah's coming. They speak of life from the dead. They speak of the resurrection, the redemption of the world. The resurrection of the dead and the redemption of the world. The rabbis are saying that all the mercy of God comes from Golgotha. It's amazing. From Golgotha, the place where he died. Calvary means the place of the skull. Golgotha means the place of the skull. They, they, don't, they get it all confused. It's an it's a incredible mystical thing that I think the Holy Spirit just got in there. It doesn't make any sense at all. It says, and from this comes drips, salvation, drips, resurrection. Why on earth would the rabbis put that in there? It makes no sense at all, except that God just slipped it in. This is from Rabbi Zohar 3, 128b. In the Golgotha, Golgotha, sit thousands of myriads of worlds. And from the Golgotha, Golgotha, drips dew and fills, the, the dew fills the world and the dead will awaken in the world to come as the dew comes forth. The dew is the light of the Ancient One. The light of the Ancient One comes from Golgotha and as it touches the dead come to life. From Golgotha is the light of God bringing life from the dead. Golgotha, the radiance of God that brings us life. Whoa. That's amazing stuff. And that may be the first time it's ever been said. Because you have to be a believer and you have to be in that stuff. The death of Messiah. All pinpointed in time and space. Moses zeroed in on the day, Passover. He dies on the day that the lamb is killed. The prophets, Daniel zeroes in on the time period, mathematically, before 70 AD, Daniel, those 77s. The rabbis in the book of Moed, unwittingly, in another thing we share this, zero in on the year by saying that the cosmic change all took place in the year 30 AD. And now the very hill, the very place here in, of all places, the rabbinical writings, the Zohar, unwittingly gives the name of it, Golgotha, which is exactly what they would have called it, and teaches that Golgotha is the center of everything, of God's mercy. You want mercy? You go there. Listen to the rabbis. On that point, go there. Even life from the dead, lives are redeemed. So... I think ultimately what life is about is we want our prayers answered. We have desires, we pray, we want an answer. And about three, four weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, Michael Berg revealed a profound, stunning, startling 
insight from the Zohar and Rabbi Ashlag how to get your prayers answered. He explained that we, our prayers need to reach the top of the spherot, a realm of dimension called, don't worry if you don't know this word, just follow along, just let it roll with you, Atika Kedisha. And that when our prayers reach that realm, that is the source, that is the source where the answers come. And it connects to the concept of resurrection. Because we're in a realm of where there's life and death, where the true reality and the level of Tika Kedisha is immortality. So in our life, happiness dies, good health dies, a marriage dies, things come to an end. But in the endless, everything is endless, which is immortal. So we want to reach that realm called the Tika Kedisha, which will resurrect our happiness, resurrect our health, resurrect a relationship, resurrect financial prosperity, and the ultimate, as we continue transforming, resurrect paradise. Bring back the endless and restore infinite endless happiness forever. Even our ability, because we don't believe it's going to happen, even to resurrect our certainty that it will happen and it will happen in this life. So Atika Kedisha, Michael Berg explained from Rabbi Ashlag, is the source where prayers are answered through the energy of resurrection. Whatever form of happiness dies in our life, it can be re resurrected when we connect to that realm. He explained, and it says in the Zohar, that there's a dew in, that will come in the end of days, and this dew will drip into this world and bring about the resurrection of the dead. And that will be the arrival of the Messiah. But we're not talking about the dew you find on your front lawn. Michael was explaining, Rabbi Ashlag was explaining, the Zohar explains, the dew corresponds to the Tetragrammaton, the holy name of God, the four-letter name, the yud K vav K. Specifically, we know the final letter, He, refers to this physical reality where there is life and there is death. And the upper three letters correspond to Atika Kedisha, the upper realm, the upper worlds, where there's immortality. The Du has the same numerical value, the, letter, the, the, the word Du in Hebrew, which is Tal, has the same numerical value as the Yud, K, Vav, the three letters which correspond to the Atika, Kadisha, that realm we want to reach. Everybody with me? In the Torah, in Deuteronomy, there is a verse that says, the Torah will not be forgotten from the mouth of his offspring. Whose offspring? That these secrets of Kabbalah these secrets of Torah, which are just here to teach us how to resurrect happiness, how to resurrect all the goodness in our life. The Torah is our teaching how to get there. The Torah should not be forgotten in the world. Who's the offspring? The Kabbalists show us a great code. If you take the last letter of each word in that verse, this is a, 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 this is a way Kabbalists and the Torah encode a lot of secrets, the last letter of a word, in that verse it spells Yochai. The offspring of Yochai was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He is the son of Yochai. So through Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the secrets of Kabbalah and the secrets of Torah will never be forgotten to the world. Lag Omer is the day, not only that Rabbi Shimon left this world, this is the day he came out of the cave after he was given, revealed to him, downloaded the entire wisdom of Zohar. This day of Rabbi Shimon coming out of the cave with the teachings of the Zohar, according to all Kabbalists in history, is equivalent to Moses coming down the mountain with the tablets. In fact, Moses was in a cave when he came down with the second tablets. So what are the teachings of Rabbi Shimon? What are we not here to forget? What do we have to remember? He told us 2,000 years ago the structure of reality, how life works. 
where Atika Kadisha is, our physical world and the, and the nine other dimensions. Rabbi Shimon revealed the meaning of life, how to connect our world to the world where we can resurrect our happiness, restore goodness and happiness by transforming ourselves. But this truth was concealed because we have to earn it. That's why the Torah was written as a code. Because if it just told us how to do it, and we knew the structure of the ten sefirot and everything, then we might as well just be handed paradise from the moment we were created. Instead, we asked for the opportunity to be the cause of, and the creators of our own happiness. We want to affect the resurrection of the dead, of everything that's dead in our life. So it was concealed. So there are many terms that have been created to conceal these secret teachings of the Zohar. Ten commandments or ten utterances is one. We think it's about commandments and, and what you can do and can't do. Of course, the ten commandments are all about the ten dimensions and how to connect to them. We know those who were studied at the center, we know the, the ten dimensions are called Ketuchach Mabina, Chesuk Fer, blah, 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 all the way down to Malchut, another term. The ten sefirot are also known as the tree of life. They're also known by the phrase, the upper three are called Atika Kedisha. We know the bottom six are Zeran Pin. And we know the lower world is what? Our kingdom. Another word used to describe the sefirot is Adam Kadmon. Not Adam and Eve, but Adam Kadmon, who's a metaphor for the, the whole structure of the ten. The Zohar also says, we don't have time tonight, I, ask, I, don't, I can't show you the passages now, but it says the upper three are the father, Zeron Pin, the six are known as the son. In fact, Rabbi Isaac Luria the Re calls it the firstborn son of the Holy One, blessed be he. So Zeron Pin is called the son, and Malchut is called the Holy Spirit. In fact, there's a plaque in uh, Germany, in... Uh, in um, in Passau, where it says, from the 14th century, there's a plaque in the back of a church. It says, Holy, 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 by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The first holy is the Father, the second holy is the Son, and the third holy is the Holy Spirit. And of course, in Kabbalah, in the center, we, we refer to these realms as the 1%, our physical world, and the upper realm as the 99%. We hear the word repentance a lot in English, but the whole purpose of Kabbalah is repentance, but that's not the word. The word is tshuva, which means to return. We want to return this physical world back to the 99% reality. And of course, we know we connect to the realm called Zeron Pin, which is called the sun. So repentance really means we want to return this physical world to the sun or to Zeron Pin, or to the 99% reality. The only way to connect to the Father, Atika Kadisha, the higher level, Chachma is the Father, is by going through the Son. You have to connect to Zeron Pin. We don't connect directly to the upper realms. We don't connect directly to Atika Kadisha. We just have to raise the physical world, our world, in our own personal lives and globally, to the realm above us, which is Yesod, which is part of Zeron Pin, which is called the Son of the Holy One. Blessed be He. The only way to connect, how do you return? Get rid of the ego. That's it. We like to wish, I love you, and we, that we wish peace on earth, and we want to spread love to everybody. Not going to happen. You can only share what you have. First, get rid of the ego. And then your love will come naturally. Because any love we think we're doing now, through our 2,000 years, has really been need. It's what I get from the relationship, not what I can give. And that's okay. But to get to unconditional love, that's the path of Kabbalah. Get rid of the ego, which is why nobody wants to walk the path. It's too freaking hard to get rid of your ego. Now, what happens in a generation when people don't want to walk the path and get rid of their ego. Let's look into the Zohar of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Verse 6, volume 12. For when there are evil people, 
the righteous and pious that are among them are punished for their sins. Sound familiar? It says in the Zohar, we have learned that when the world is full of the sins of mankind and judgment is pronounced, woe to the righteous one who is found in the world, for he is the first to be punished for the sins of the wicked. Sound familiar? This is exactly what the Holy One, blessed be he, did with the generation. He offered the righteous man for indictment in order to save the generation on his account. So, in two concepts, we just covered the whole ideology of Christianity. The only way to the Father is through the Son, and the righteous one of a generation will be inflicted with suffering and pain and death to save the generation. But this is still before there was something called Christianity. The Zohar continues, Happy is the portion of that righteous man who is strong in suffering afflictions and who by means of his afflictions manages to overcome his accuser, the Satan, who has spread his control over the whole generation. And it is accounted to him, that person, as though he had saved them. And the Holy One, blessed be he, appoints him as shepherd over them. There is a mystery in Christianity. We all heard today, but it was supposed to be the end of the world. It's the end of the world. It's the end of the world of illusion and misconception and falsehood about Christianity and Jesus' true teachings. Because right now, for the first time in human history, we're going to tell you publicly what's been going on and what it really means and how it's going to bring peace to Christians, Israelites, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, everybody. It says Jesus was crucified in a place called Golgotha. If you look at the New Testament, it says, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. It actually says in the New Testament that the word is Aramaic. No one knows for the last 2,000 years why that name was chosen, Golgotha. Why the place of the skull? No one knows where Golgotha is. There's been all kinds of theories, what it is, where it is. Golgotha remains one of the biggest riddles in Christianity. The Catholic Encyclopedia admits no one knows the origin of the name Golgotha, where it comes from. The name Golgotha is not to be found anywhere in all Hebrew literature. There was no such place known to the ancients in pre-Christian times. Some say the skull refers to the skull of Adam and Eve, of, of Adam. Meet Origen. He's one of the founding fathers of Christianity. One of the earliest fathers of the church. He says, Golgotha, pro and he lives like literally 100, 200 years after Jesus. Golgotha probably refers to the burial place of the skull of Adam. Origen says, quote, I have received a tradition to the effect that the body of Adam, the first man, was buried upon the spot where Christ was crucified. Meet Tertullian, another church father, 160 A.D. There is a place, he wrote 2,000 years ago, now Golgotha, the place of the skull named in the earlier tongue. Here is the earth's center. Here was victory won. Here, the ancients say, was found a mighty head. St. Jerome wrote Golgotha was connected to the skull of Adam. But the Adam theory doesn't hold up because Adam and Eve are buried here. Hebron, Israel. The tomb of the patriarchs. Christians, Muslims, and Israelites all acknowledge that's where Adam and Eve are buried, along with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, all theories about Golgotha throughout history are either too remote, too isolated, absurd, weak. They fall short proof of facts. Nobody knows what it is. 
We know in the New Testament it says to the masses Jesus spoke in parables, metaphors. To the disciples of his inner circle, he revealed the mysteries. So remember these clues. Skull, resurrection of the dead, Adam. All these are connected to the story of Jesus, right? He died in Golgotha, he was resurrected, and the place, it means the place of the skull, and the earliest church fathers say it's connected to Adam. In your siddur is the answer. If you look in the siddur of the Kabbalah Center, you'll find Takuni Nefesh. At the very top, you'll find the word Golgotha. It's up by the head, Keter. Everybody see it? So where is Golgotha? It's from the Zohar. What is Golgotha? It's the top of the Sfirot in the Zohar. It's Atika Kadisha. The Zohar also uses the word Golgotha to describe the whole upper three Sfirot. What's the connection to skull and resurrection? Let's look in the Zohar. Into this skull, Golgotha drips dew from the white head. And from this dew, the dead will be restored to life. Resurrection. It's in the Zohar. When they said they can't find any ancient Hebrew writings with Golgotha, the Zohar was kept secret. Nobody knew it. It's been in the Zohar for 2,000 years. This is what Rabbi Shimon taught tonight to his disciples. The Zohar says, from the dew, and remember, we're not talking about dew, we're talking about the Yud Kevav. From this dew in the skull Golgotha, man is ground for the righteous for the world to come, and through it the dead shall be revived. Golgotha was never a physical location. Golgotha is the place we need to reach to ignite the resurrection of our happiness, the answers to our prayers, by climbing up the tree of life by transforming and getting rid of our egos. Nowhere in ancient writings do we find the Aramaic word Golgotha except for the Zohar. What's the connection to Adam? It's not the skull of Adam and Eve, it's the skull of Adam Kadmon, the Adam from the Zohar. But of course, the early church fathers weren't privy to the teachings that were taking place tonight, but word slipped out. They knew the name Adam was involved. They knew Skull was involved. They knew Golgotha was involved. They just didn't get the whole story. Adam Kadmon is the primordial man, a metaphor for the ten sphere rod. It's his skull that the Zohar speaks about. Next mystery. On the top of every cross, you see the phrase, Inri. Everybody know that? They've seen that before? It's on every painting. Why Inri? No one knows why Inri appears at the top of the cross. Here's a list of uh, explanations. Everyone has their own theory. Remember, to earn the wisdom, we have to conceal it. So that's what happened. They put up a curtain in front of the Sfirot. One, two, and that creates the whole story of Golgotha. Zaron Pin, which we connect to, is the Son of God. As we transform our body, our consciousness step by step, we connect to that dew, the light of the upper world, Atika Kadisha, also called Golgotha in the Zohar, the source of all. I went over to Michael Berg after his lecture on Shabbat, and I said, Golgotha, right? He smiles. He says, yep, Golgotha is the whole Atika Kadisha. You should go listen to his lecture. It's, it's freaking mind-blowing. And when we make that connection, we resurrect happiness. Now, we must conceal the name of the teacher. So remember the technique the Kabbalists used? You only keep the last letter. Let's take out the fir first words, the first letters for Rabbi, Shimon, Bar, Yochai. And that's Inri. Using the same coded system of using the last letters. So these two pictures you see right here, it's the same story. Just one was concealed in Christianity, says the Kabbalists, because the Israelites lost the merit to have Kabbalah, so it was hidden inside Christianity. Go to Kabbalah TV, you'll see the lecture why. But that's why they're using different words from the Zohar. 
the murder of Jesus, then what's the cross all about? Peter told the Jewish authorities they had killed Christ by hanging him on a tree. Acts 5.30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Acts 5.30. And we are witness of all things where he, Jesus, did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. He was hung on a tree. What then is the cross according to the earliest Christian fathers? I'm just going to show you a couple. The tree of life is the cross, which gave a radiant life to our race. The tree of life is the cross. Where is the tree of life today? The children of Israel in the future will taste in the tree of life, which is the book of Zohar. This is what the whole world is looking for. This is what they've always been looking for. The Zohar is the tree of life. It's the power of Golgotha. It's the dew of resurrection. It's Atika Kedisha. It is the path to eternal life. Rabbi Eli Elijah ben Omazeg, Italian Kabbalist, says... Back a couple hundred years ago, Jesus learned everything from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. This, this man's writings have been censored, edited, torn out of manuscripts that I got from museums and from uh, universities in Israel because they don't want you to see what I'm showing you now. Better than a man throw himself into a burning furnace than make his fellow man blush before the world. And who is the author of this saying? He who was best representative of the school from which Christianity has drawn its dogmas and its ethics, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon is the author of Kabbalah, and Kabbalah has given Christianity everything. The school of Kabbalah, represented by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, provided Christianity with all of its ethics and its dogmas. Ultimately, Kabbalah alone is capable of restoring harmony between Hebraism and the Christian world. Kabbalah gave the following ideas to Christianity, the doctrine of the Word and the Son of God and the Trinity. And even Maimonides, an anti-Kabbalist, said, ultimately all the deeds of Jesus of Nazareth will only serve to prepare the way for the Messiah's coming and the improvement of the entire world motivating the Gentiles to serve God together with the Israelites. Bottom line, they're identical. Atika Kedisha is Golgotha. Chochmah, Zerun Pin, and Malchut is the Trinity. Zerun Pin, the 99%, the letter Vav in the name of God, is the Son of God, the Christ, meaning salvation. The tense Sferot, Tree of Life, is the cross, Tree of Life. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is Zinri. Thank you very much, and have a good evening.